This is a mechanism of disease map for acute compartment syndrome. I'll be talking about compartment syndrome of the extremities of the limbs compared to abdominal compartment syndrome, and there will be another video on that. We'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of acute compartment syndrome of the extremities. And as in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right. Let's get started by clearing out all the boxes and repopulating this flowchart one by one. So at the center of the pathophysiology for acute compartment syndrome is increased pressure within a fascial compartment. You have fascial compartments in all of your extremities, and when pressure in there gets too high, there are two downstream effects. You're going to obstruct the venous outflow, and you're also going to collapse the arterioles that are entering that fascial compartment. So essentially, you're going to have stagnant blood and that's going to decrease tissue perfusion, which then decreases the oxygen supply to the muscles, and over time, after about four to six hours, you can have irreversible damage to the muscles. Of course, low oxygen means ischemia, which means necrosis to the muscles and the nerves inside that compartment. So that's what happens here. You have very high pressure inside a fascial compartment, you're obstructing blood flow, venous outflow and the arterioles are both collapsed and obstructed, decreasing tissue perfusion, leading to low oxygen, ischemia, and irreversible damage through necrosis. And we'll see all of the manifestations come out of this uh, pathophysiology here. Before we talk about the manifestations, let's work our way back to the etiology. We said we had increased pressure in the fascial compartments, and that could either be from external compression or internal compression. So we're going to break down our etiologies according to these two buckets, external compression and internal compression. Let's start with external compression. It's possible to have burn eschars. These are circumferential burns that cause inflammation and tightening around a limb from the outside. That would cause external compression. It's also possible, after somebody has broken a leg or broken a, a limb or broken a bone or something, to put bandages on or to put a cast on too tight before the limb has stopped swelling. You want to make sure the limb has swelled to its maximum circumference before putting on any kind of constrictive bandage or cast. If you don't, the limb is going to continue to swell under that constriction and that will cause external compression, which can lead to acute compartment syndrome of that extremity. Lastly, for the external compression, in, especially in patients that are immobile or that aren't able to move on themselves, if they are positioned poorly, they can, that can lead to external compression. For instance, if they have their arm resting on an armrest that's squeezing a main artery or group of arterioles leading into that arm, that can lead to a form of acute, com acute compartment syndrome through external compression as well. Internal compression has a bit of a longer list for the etiology. Let's start with hematomas, a bleed under the skin. You can get a hematoma, for instance, from long bone fractures. And we'll notice that a lot of these are trauma-related. Burn eschars, constrictive bandages after a uh, limb is broken, long bone fractures. We're going to have a bunch of other trauma-related. So this is something that um, typically happens after somebody gets hurt. And a hematoma can happen after a long bone fracture. Severe edema can also cause internal compression. You can also have severe edema from long bone fractures. There are a bunch of other things that cause edema. Burns can cause a significant amount of swelling, enough to cause internal compression and acute compartment syndrome. Some animal bites, especially animal bites that have venom, like snake bites, can cause severe edema. That's your body reacting to that venom in the snake bite. And you can also have reperfusion syndrome that causes significant edema that can lead to compartment syndrome. Reperfusion syndrome is when you're finally reperfusing a limb or a body part after it's been ischemic for a while, and that causes severe swelling, severe edema. Another form of internal compression is from an IV infusion. This is usually iatrogenic. If the IV extra, extravasates, if, it, if you have extravasation of the IV, that can lead to internal compression as the IV fluids, like the saline or whatever the patient is getting, gets dripped into their limb, into the fascial compartment. It can increase the pressure there. You can also have inflammation from repetitive muscle use. If you're going to the gym and using your muscles a lot, you know that your muscles swell up a lot, and that can cause internal compression. 
in a situation that causes acute compartment syndrome, this might result from seizures, where you have that tonic-clonic activity in a muscle where the muscle is repetitively used. And this also happens in excessive running, in long-distance runners, where they're using their legs for hours at a time. They can get swelling in their legs that can lead to compartment syndrome as well. Another form of internal compression sp comes from spontaneous bleeding. This especially happens in people that have coagulopathies, and there are many things that cause coagulopathies. It could be genetic coagulopathy, it could be an autoimmune uh, reason that you don't have platelets, maybe your body's attacking your own platelets. It could also be a biochemical or metabolic etiology of coagulopathy. But in any case, if you bleed a lot into your limbs, that can also cause internal compression. Next, hemorrhage into your muscle compartments. There are a few things that cause hemorrhage. Most of these are traumas. Gunshots, for instance, can lead you to break an artery and bleed into your muscle compartment. Stab wounds can do the same thing. Another iatrogenic cause, a radial artery perforation, can cause a pretty significant hemorrhage into your arms. Uh, this typically happens after a cardiac procedure that uses your radial artery to do some kind of intravascular um, cardiac procedure like stenting. And um, it's, a, it's a very unfortunate outcome, but it is uh, something that we need to be on the lookout for when assessing for compartment syndrome. Lastly, this is not a penetrating injury, but you can have a crush injury that also causes hemorrhage into that muscle compartment. When you deep when you do a deep tissue injury, that can also cause a hemorrhage. There's one thing missing here, and it's increased capillary permeability. That can also lead to internal compression. When you have septic shock, for instance, or any other type of shock, um, that leads to increased capillary permeability. You can have a bunch of fluid that leaves your vasculature into your fascial compartment, and that can also cause internal compression. So these are the many etiologies, and we can kind of see how they lead to increased pressure in that fascial compartment. Now let's talk about the manifestations of acute compartment syndrome. We can break these down into early features that happen within one or two hours of the injury of the, of the actual compartment syndrome, or late features, which happen around four plus hours. First, the early features, pain is likely gonna be the most prominent symptom to start, and this pain is usually out of proportion to the injury. Sometimes the patients describe it as a deep or burning pain, and they'll often have trouble localizing it, pointing to the entire limb rather to a specific part of their leg or arm. This pain is usually worse with passive stretch or extension of the muscle, and the limb itself is usually extremely tender to the touch on your physical exam. Patients might also have significant soft tissue swelling on your exam to the point where the muscles can be tight and wood-like. And it's especially helpful to compare to the other limb, which hopefully does not have compartment syndrome, and see that one of the muscles is very tight compared to the other one. Next, the late features can be broken down um, from this ir irreversible muscle damage to neuro deficits and impaired perfusion. The neuro deficits manifest as paresthesias. This is a pins and needles sensation. And of course, if your nerves are damaged, you're also gonna have muscle weakness or paralysis as well. And you would also expect them to have sensory deficits. They might just be numb in the entire limb after those, uh, after those nerves are damaged. Impaired perfusion leads to a cold extremity, and this extremity might lose its color. It might become white uh, with pallor. They'll also have absent or weak distal pulses. So if they have compartment syndrome in their thigh, they might have very weak pulses down in the foot, for instance. In general, you can use this as a guide of the six P's of acute limb ischemia when assessing for acute compartment syndrome. I've kind of highlighted them all, um, bolded them, and underlined them all in these results, but it's pain, pallor, paresthesias, uh, poikilothermia, which essentially means unable to regulate your own body temperature, so that's kind of like that cold extremity here, pulselessness, we said weak pulses, and paralysis, which we've marked here as well. You don't necessarily have all of these P's, um, especially in the early course of acute compartment syndrome, and this might en end up being more helpful on board exams or on standardized tests, but it's a helpful way to help you remember all of the features. Just don't um, exclude acute compartment syndrome if you don't have six of these. Lastly, a couple notes on how to diagnose acute compartment syndrome. You can actually measure the pressure within that fascial compartment with an invasive compartment pressure measurement. This is when you measure the delta pressure, which is the diastolic blood pressure minus the intracompartmental pressure. And there is kind of this threshold. If your delta pressure is less than or equal to 30 millimeters of mercury, that suggests that you have acute compartment 
syndrome. And I guess more significant than that threshold itself is if that delta P is rising or sustained. That would be more concerning for acute compartment syndrome. You want that pressure to be going down as the swelling, as the source of the pressure resolves. Some other tests you might do, you might do x-rays. This can help you identify associated fractures. We saw that many of these etiologies were trauma related, so you probably want to do an x-ray to look at any long bone fractures or look at any like stab wounds, gunshots, to see exactly what you damaged. Lastly, if you suspect rhabdomyolysis, which is one of the causes of acute compartment syndrome, after, for instance, a crush or a deep tissue injury, you can do a series of blood and urine tests to assess for that. In the case of rhabdomyolysis, of crush injury, you'll have increased creatinine kinase, increased LDH, and increased myoglobin in the blood, and you'll also expect to see myoglobin in the urine as well. This has been a short flow chart on acute compartment syndrome of the limbs. I hope it was helpful. You can look out for a compartment syndrome of the abdomen, abdominal compartment syndrome next, and thank you for listening.